Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Forks Over Knives webinar series. Today, we are here with none other than the legend, Dr. Christy Funk. Dr. Cr Funk, how are you today? I'm great, Cyrus. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, breast cancer kicking strategies. Yeah. Uh, and you are, I can safely say that you are not only an expert, when it comes to uh, understanding breast cancer and all the ramifications, all the tentacles associated with it, but you are a world expert and you are constantly being interviewed in summits, in masterclasses, in webinars, you name it. And I've personally had the opportunity to get to know you over the course of the last couple of years. And uh, I can safely say that uh, your information is fantastic. So I'm personally very excited to uh, hear you once again, talk about uh, breast cancer and beyond. I love it. Can't wait to kick it with you. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who are just joining us, it looks like we have uh, almost a thousand of you in the room so far, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, Dr. Funk is going to be talking about uh, breast cancer and uh, all the ramifications thereof. Um, she's going to be sharing a lot of the common misconceptions about breast cancer, and she's going to present evidence-based nutrition and lifestyle secrets to you living your healthiest lifestyle at a low risk for the development of breast cancer and also for the reversal of any type of cancer progression that you may be living with. Now, if you aren't familiar uh, very specifically with Dr. Funk and her work, uh, let me tell you just a little bit about her. I'm gonna brag on her behalf right now. Uh, she's a board certified breast cancer surgeon and physician. She's a best-selling author. She's an international keynote speaker and women's health advocate. She graduated uh, with distinction from Stanford University, uh, completed her general surgery residency in Seattle at a breast fe uh, fellowship in Los Angeles. Uh, now, Dr. Funk also practices as a breast cancer surgeon at the Pink Lotus Breast Cancer Center in Los Angeles, where she excels in minimally invasive diagnostic and treatment methods for all types of breast diseases. Uh, she's helped literally thousands of women navigate breast specific issues, including celebrities such as Angelina Jolie and Sheryl Crow. Hopefully that's not a HIPAA violation that we're mentioning their names, is it? It is not. It is in public domain. Public domain. <laughs> well, fantastic. Uh, now, in addition to being a breast cancer specialist, she also has done extensive research into nutritional science, uh, and that has sparked a passionate vision within her to complement her medical practice with a life empowering uh, cancer kicking summit, which teaches women and men how to maximally reduce their chances of facing cancer and any other controllable chronic disease. Her summit is actually coming up in a few days and we've put the link in the chat box for that. So if you guys are interested in participating in her summit, I can tell you it's gonna be fantastic and uh, put it on your calendar and uh, listen up because she's got a lot of fantastic information to share. So today in specific, Dr. Funk is going to teach us three things and three very important things. Number one, the four boulders on the scales of health that tip you towards breast cancer or away from it. Okay. Very, very, very important information. Number two, uh, she's going to teach you guys how every time you lift a fork and put it into your mouth or a spoon, you either fight breast cancer or you fuel it. Everything relates to what is on your fork or spoon. She's also going to tell you the top 12 foods that breast cancer hates more than your kids hate cabbage. <laughs> Classic. Now, if you have any specific questions that you'd like Dr. Funk to answer, uh, we're going to be having a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Um, or we have a team in the background who's going to be reading questions because they usually come in relatively quickly. So we're going to do our best to gather all those questions and then talk about them at the end of the webinar. Um, before we go any further, please, in the chat box, tell us your name and where you're coming from. And then also, in addition to doing that, um, I hesitate to ask this, but I'm going to do it. Could you guys give me a one in the chat box if you are plant-based and a two in the chat box if you are not plant-based and then a 1.5, uh, you know, if you're sort of halfway there or in the process of transitioning. Can we see what we have here? The only reason I hesitate to ask this is because the response is coming so quickly that I can't read it, but <laughs> let's see. Looks like we have a lots of 1.5s. Um, if I had to hazard a guess, 
um, we're somewhere probably like a 1.3, maybe like a 1.2, something like that. So predominantly a plant-based audience with some people that are maybe in the middle of a transition and then some people who are still not plant-based, which is totally fine. Okay. And then for those of you who don't know me, my name is Cyrus Kambada. Uh, I have a PhD in nutritional biochemistry and I've been living with type one diabetes for uh, at this point, 19 years. Uh, I also transitioned to eating a low fat plant-based whole food diet back in 2003, way before it was even cool. And in the process of doing that, I've been able to transform my health from the inside out and normalize my blood glucose values and inject a very small amount of insulin on a daily basis. Um, I am not the star of the show today by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just the MC. I'm here to uh, facilitate the conversation and make sure that Dr. Funk has a fantastic time. I'm going to be your webinar host and um, we're going to have a lot of fun today. So uh, Dr. Funk, did I miss anything that you're going to be covering today in your presentation? You did not. That was very thorough. We just don't know what the Q&A is going to bring. That's true. It's going to be very fun. I can tell you. I can tell you that for sure. So, so far we have uh, 1,500 of you guys here, which is, which is bonkers. I love that. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. Before we get into the meat of our presentation, pun intended, um, we are going to, I'm going to share my screen with you guys. And uh, I want to tell you about the uh, Forks Over Knives cooking course, because the Forks Over Knives cooking course is, uh, there's a limited time promotion on it. And I want to make sure that you guys can uh, take advantage of this if you would like. Okay. Uh, let me just do this. Here we go. Um, now, making whole food uh, plant-based eating is actually relatively easy. It's, it's simple, but it's not easy. And uh, the Forks Over Knives team does everything they can to make this process enjoyable and accessible for everybody, regardless of what stage you're at in the process of transitioning towards a more plant-based diet. And if you have made that uh, transition or you're interested in doing so, we know that there's a lot of major adjustments which are necessary to your routine and to the logistics of your life. And the Forks Over Knives team recognizes that. And they want you to understand that we're all in this together. And they, are, uh, they have done a really good job of making at-home tools that are very accessible. Uh, and one of them is this digital product called the Forks Over Knives cooking course. So for anyone who's adopting a plant-based diet, but not be super comfortable in the kitchen, this is for you. This cooking course can give you the confidence and culinary skills that you need to prepare a variety of healthy and delicious plant-based meals. Uh, the best part is they're offering their course at 25% off through October 15th, which is just a few days from now. So let me show you the highlights of this cooking course, okay? The Forks Over Knives cooking course are led by professional plant-based chef educators. They're presented completely online and they're designed for you to participate at your own pace. So you can do your curriculum around your schedule because we know your schedule is different than our schedule. The lessons run over the course of about three months and you get lifetime access to the lessons and you can revisit them at any time if you want to. Now, there's two fun and flexible courses to choose from. The ultimate course is an immersive experience focused on foundational plant-based techniques that is designed to substantially boost your skills and confidence in the kitchen. The essentials course is a shorter abbreviated version with lessons like knife skills, basic oil-free cooking techniques and daily meal planning strategies to help you kickstart your whole food plant-based cooking routine. So it's up to you which one you would like to participate in. Both courses are packed with lessons that are in video format in, with clear instruction and a great selection of new recipes. And I really do mean that. The recipes are unbelievable. Um, and there's plenty of content to keep you focused and energized. There's lots of fun interactive quizzes, there's instructor graded activities, and there's live events for you to participate in. So you don't feel like you're just going through, you know, a collection of videos that isn't engaging. Now, thousands of students have enrolled in these courses and the response has been overwhelmingly positive. Most students finish their course with improved kitchen skills and a huge boost to their cooking confidence. And their courses are always a great way to connect with other people and make sure that you're going through this process in a more community style format. And healthy and fresh foods are vital to keeping your immune system strong and fight off disease, especially in this, in this world in which we live. You're gonna feel great knowing that you can not only invest in, in improving your cooking skills, but that you can build for a lifetime and continue to create delicious meals that are gonna keep you and your family safe and healthy over the course of time. 
So if you're interested in joining, which I highly recommend, and I'm going to tell you this, I personally am going to be joining one of these future cooking courses. I'm going to, I'm going to try and get into this one if I can make it happen, but if I can't, then I'm going to the next one. And I am personally very excited for this. Uh, this self-paced course allows you to start whenever you'd like, but if you want to get involved in this uh, promotion, then it's, I highly recommend signing up now. Use the coupon code, which you see at the top of your screen right here, FOK25, to save 25%. You just have to go to forkserverknives.com slash cooking dash course, forkserverknives.com slash cooking dash course, and enter the code FOK25. It'll save you 25% off. And that's a way to get started today to make sure that you set yourself up for success. So without much further ado, I would like to turn the stage over to Dr. Funk. Dr. Funk, how, are you, you ready to uh, present your magic today? I'm ready. Are you guys ready to hear my magic? It's pretty magical. So <laughs> what we're going to do, <laughs> we're going to start with this PowerPoint that I've prepared and we'll just jump right into it. And at the end, we will emerge with, I hope, a bunch of questions and hopefully some transformed lives. Absolutely. So here I go, I'm gonna screen share. All right, there we go. Portion of screen. Share. No pressure. You only have 1600 people that are staring intently at the screen. So don't. <laughs> good thing I didn't like bring up some sort of like unbecoming picture of <laughs> <laughs> one time I was uh, at Cedars uh, back when I was pregnant. I, so I've, we have triplet sons. My husband hates it when I say it. they're my, my boys, our boys. I was pregnant as can be. And I just, I never did those like professional portraits. So I took a bunch of pictures of my big, big stomach. This was like three weeks before delivery. And mm -hmm. then I was giving a PowerPoint presentation and was trying to set it up like this and boom, up popped my entire desktop, which was just my tummy over and over and over again. <laughs> Ow! Nobody wanted to see that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You're like, how do I stop the screen share? What do I do? <laughs> Chaos. Um, okay. It was just a few hundred people. All right, here we go. Breast right, go for defense, it. cancer kicking strategies. All right, I'm gonna start with a little bit of setting the stage. Let's get the landscape going. Breast facts. There are 3.8 million breast cancer survivors and thrivers in the US who either currently have or have had breast cancer. However, over 2 million women have died since 1970. So while we are detecting cancers earlier and treatments are constantly evolving and improving, we've got some work to do people and I have some ideas how to do it. I don't think the next great med needs to be our solution. There will be approximately 268,000 invasive breast cancers diagnosed this year and almost 42,000 deaths. I first want to hit the top three risk factors over which you have zero control, not to freak you out, but actually just to educate you if you don't know this already, and then to incentivize you to pay oh so much more attention to all of the risk factors that you can change and control. So the very first risk factor is being female. <laughs> okay, ladies, who would want to do anything about that, right? All right, one in, what is it? One in eight women will get breast cancer in her lifetime, as opposed to, for men, 1.3 in 100,000. Somebody somewhere just went, huh, men get breast cancer? Oh, indeed they do, my friends. So this year alone, 2,670 men will be diagnosed with breast cancer and 500 will die from it. Fun fact, in utero, when we're all like teeny, teeny, tiny in the first six weeks of gestation, we all start out the greater sex. We are all girls until testosterone comes in, ruins the whole thing. No, just kidding, men. But the breast bud and the nipples in the what becomes a little baby boy fetus have already been developed. So they just stick around and out. Okay, next, age. As you age, breast cancer risk goes up. So I remember how I just said one in eight. Well, it's not one in eight chance of getting breast cancer every morning when you wake up or we'll all have it by Thanksgiving. So here's a handy table for you. Figure out your age, current age. And here is the number, the one in blank that will get breast cancer in the next decade. So if you're 20, the chances of getting breast cancer by the time you're 30 are one in 1,479. If you're 30, one in 209 by the time you're 40. 
if you're 40, between 40 and 50, one in 65, 50 and 60, one in 42, 60 and 70, one in 28, 70 and 80, ding, ding, ding. This is the highest risk decade in which you might get breast cancer, one in 25, and then 80 to 90, one in 33. I want this table to go from 90 to 100. Like we should all be centenarians. And I want these numbers to go lower. And I have a really good idea about how that might happen. So, so far we've got being female and aging. And my third big risk factor is family history. Why are doctors so interested in family history? Well, you might know it's because if there's a whole lot of cancer in the family, you might have an inherited genetic mutation, such as BRCA, CHECK2, PALB2. There's a smattering of them that elevate breast cancer risk. And maybe it just, there's a gene that we haven't tested for yet, right, that runs in the family. And let's use BRCA as an example. This is what your risks elevate to if you have a BRCA gene mutation. There's up to an 87% lifetime chance of breast cancer, well, by age 70, not that that's not much Christy. of a I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I apologize. Do you mind if I uh, just stop you for a second? I think no. there's some people in the chat box who are saying that they cannot see your screen. So can you stop your screen share and then restart it once again? Stop. Stop. I don't know if this is just a tech glitch. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. No, it's fine. I wonder what they were looking at. Maybe not, not my pregnant stomach. Was that up there? <laughs> <laughs> they were like, well, How's that's a big that? thing. Do we have any... <laughs> Hands raised. Are we good now? Um, I will let you know if there's any more comments, but for now, why don't we just continue? No worries. Okay. So Thanks. this is the elevation in risk for breast and ovarian cancer for BRCA gene mutation carriers. They can have up to an 87% chance of getting breast by age 70, whereas general population risk is 8% by 70 and up to a 44% chance of ovarian cancer by age 70. So we really, really want to know when people have gene mutations, not just because we're gonna knee jerk reaction say, mastectomies and ovaries out. But because this gives us such a heads up about your risk that we can be really much more proactive about surveillance. So here are the red flags for a possible gene mutation. First of all, news flash, you're half your dad's DNA. For some reason, people are, even doctors are like, oh, well, that's your dad's sister. So that doesn't really count. Uh, it counts like half your DNA is from your dad. So you want to think about first, second, and third generation relatives on both sides of the family. And here is your bullet point list for having a 10% or greater chance of a gene mutation. If two relatives on the same side of the family have breast cancer prior to age 50 or ovarian cancer at any age, the Jewish special, if you're Ashkenazi and you only need one of the above, one breast cancer prior to 50 or one ovarian at any age. Why? Because Ashkenazis uh, and those from European, Eastern European descent carry a BRCA or BRCA gene mutation at a rate of one in 40, whereas everyone else in the world is one in 500 at a baseline. So if you yourself have had breast cancer prior to menopause, a triple negative subtype prior to age 60, you would know it if you did, or if you've had two breast cancers, not a recurrence, but two completely different ones. If there are any men in the family tree with breast cancer, a known gene mutation carrier with a direct bloodline to you. If there's pancreatic plus either ovarian or breast. And finally, if there's three or more, just a whole lot of cancer going on, breast, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate, colorectal, gastric, uterine, and melanoma, then you should test. You can visit, uh, a genetics expert, you can call Pink Lotus Breast Center and I can help you out, or you can just go online. We have a online women's health and breast cancer store and color is an, an approved test that looks at 30 different gene mutations. And the best part is you can just order it online, register it, whoop, gets mailed to your house, you spit in a tube, send it back, and it comes with board certified genetic counseling about your results. And if you're worried about, there are federal and state laws that protect against genetic discrimination, but that doesn't apply yet necessarily to life insurance. So some people are just too scared about testing. And so this is your chance to put your name as Wonder Woman and who's gonna know the difference? Okay, here's something interesting. What percentage of breast cancer can be attributed to an inherited genetic mutation such as BRCA? Five to 10%, 30 to 40%, 60 to 90% or 80 to 90%. 
five to 10%. Okay, that's it. What's the opposite? 90 to 95% of all breast cancer does not come from an inherited genetic mutation. Hmm. Okay, at the other end of our bell curve, I'm gonna give you weird. Like that's just weird because it's fate or something. She's only 35 and she's been zenned out her whole life and a plant-based person since two. And you know, it's it's the story that we hear a lot, but it doesn't actually happen that way a lot. It turns out the big fat middle of our bell curve is not the super fit person who's done everything right her whole life. And it is not the genetic mutation carrier. It's the big middle. And that's where our choices come in. And I'm very excited to talk about that. But if that's true, hmm, what do you think this answer would be? What percentage of women with breast cancer have no first degree relatives with breast cancer? 16%, 45%, 61%, 87%, 87%. So it does seem to ring true and about 80% have no relatives at all with breast cancer. Hmm, so what is going on here? Let's have a look at this stat. Japanese immigrants in Los Angeles and Hawaii after 1982, and then Chinese in Hawaii after 1992, developed breast cancer at rates over 100% higher than their family in the homeland. The degree to which they assimilated into American culture, the, degree, the number of generations that had passed, the faster they reached our exact rate of breast cancer. But Look at this, back in the homeland, here's the percent change in mortality from breast cancer in Japan between 1990 and 2000. It skyrocketed 55%, whereas in the US that same decade, it dropped 15%. What happened? Well, I'll tell you, cancer isn't like a sunburn. You don't just didn't have it when you woke up and you come home with it. It's a slow burn, all right? So it takes, one cell to mutate and then become two cells and four and eight and so on. By the way, a cubic centimeter of cancer has 1 billion cells. So depending on how quickly they're dividing and what percentage of cells are dividing, if you do the math backwards on that, the majority of newly diagnosed breast cancers, the aggressive ones probably began about three, four or five years ago and the turtles, the tortoises going slower, 10 to 15 or more years ago. So. That's relevant here because what was happening in Japan more like 10, 20 years in the 70s and 80s? Well, the growing economics and increased affluence in Japan, Singapore, urban areas of China sparked westernized changes in their culture, in their diet. And as a result, they caught our cancer. So let's talk more about our style. Instead of laboring all day in the home, tending to children, preparing fresh meals, women around the world now enter the workforce in droves, leading these sedentary and stressful lives. They are delaying childbearing until later years, not breastfeeding or barely breastfeeding. They're eating leftover pizza for lunch, sending off that email ASAP, and then dashing home just in time to put takeout on the table, pour a glass of wine, and catch their latest Netflix binge. Right? Does that anybody spend some time in that club? Of all these controllable risk factors that are proven to elevate breast cancer, diet and nutrition, alcohol, exercise, obesity, hormone replacement therapy, environmental toxicities, and emotional stress, there's one thing that's more important than any other. But, spoiler alert, the top four are boulders on the scales of health either pushing you toward cancer or away. If there is a boulder on your scale, a pebble could tip the scales if the boulders weren't there, but the boulder so heavily weighs it down that these other smaller toxicities in your life really don't contribute as weightily. So the boulders are the top four, diet and nutrition, alcohol, a lack of exercise, and being overweight or obese. The other three certainly can tip the scales and certainly can trend your overall health toward a less energetic and joyful, vital life. But the boulders are where the focus is because if you don't have those, the scales readily come into balance and you can better see the pebbles and then work on those. So the one thing that's the most important in my heavily researched opinion 
is diet nutrition because you do it three to six times a day. And the key now to using food to protect yourself from breast cancer is to understand that you literally unleash weapons, chemical weapons for better or worse that hold the power to alter the following factors inside you. Estrogen levels, growth factors, IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one, blood vessel formation, angio blood vessel, genesis birth. It is the birth of new blood flow. Did you know that any cancer in your body, not just breast, needs to create its own blood supply, angiogenesis, in order to grow beyond the size of a tip of a ballpoint pen. Food alters inflammation, free radical formation, immune system function, and ultimately then DNA damage and the formation of cancer with an immune system that's dysfunctional is the recipe for a cancerous landscape. You want to think about all these factors as kind of like a little bathtub. All of your cells are bathing in this bathtub and it's either going to be elevating estrogen or decreasing it, putting in growth hormones or taking them away, adding the ability to make blood vessels or squelching them out of the environment. So these fluids and cells that bathe, support and fuel cancers could seek and destroy them. Just like Cyrus said at the top of our time together, there's so much power at the end of your fork or spoon. You just chew and swallow. But what then enters into your bloodstream and into that bathtub either stokes cancer or chokes cancer. So this won't become a crazy biochem lesson, but I want you to basically understand the basics of the battleground of oxidative stress that happens inside your cells. Free radicals, are actually useful. For example, they help us breathe. They combat infection and can actually kill the cancer cells that they help cause, which is ironic, but also useful. However, if more bad free radicals hangs around, then there is good to stop it, then oxidative stress results. And when this imbalance persists day after day, after year, after decade, your body cells in your DNA just get too beat up and sickness results. Basically, whichever organs these free radicals injure the most frequently determines what diseases you'll get. If it's your blood vessels, hello, heart disease. If it's your muscles, you're chronically fatigued or have fibromyalgia. If it's your brain, mm, I forgot what happened. Oh, dementia ah, or Alzheimer's. And of course, if there's excessive free radical damage in your breast tissue, well, eliminate oxidative stress and you just might live forever. So what, oh, what can calm the oxidants, the free radicals down? Antioxidants. And it turns out that plants have 65 times the antioxidant power of any animal-based anything. I'm gonna use this study to show you as an example. This study um, changed the life of, I hope a lot of people, because I like talking about it, but, but of, we're going to call him John. I was literally writing my book, Breasts the Owner's Manual, writing this exact thing about this study on my little laptop in the surgeon's lounge, waiting for my case to start. And in comes John, kid you not, true story, different name, sits down. He's got three pancakes, four slices of bacon, and then these um, gold foil wrapped pats of butter, three of them and a cup of coffee with cream. And this study happened, okay? So I was reading it and I'm like, oh my gosh. And I pull, I'm like, oh, don't be that girl. Don't be that girl. Don't say anything. I look over the laptop again. Don't be that girl. And finally I just closed my laptop and I was like, John, I have to tell you a story about a study. Okay, so listen, there were these 24 hyperlipidemic men and women, right? So they have high cholesterol, high lipids, and they all were fed a sad meal, right? Standard American diet, pancakes and bacon, <clears throat> steak and eggs for breakfast. And then every single hour, their blood was drawn and they measured oxidized LDL cholesterol as a measurement of the oxidative stress. So here we are on our graph, we're at time zero, and then boom, three hours later, we've got LDL going up, up, up and lunch. We're gonna have a hamburger and fries and the LDL goes up, up, up and dinner and up it goes. And these people are going to bed with fewer antioxidants than when they woke up. Here's where the magic happens. Same people, same sad meal, next day, 
one change, a cup of strawberries, hmm? pancakes and bacon and some strawberries. And what, oh, what? The LDL is actually going down. The strawberry antioxidant potential destroys the oxidants in that meal and then some. Okay, lunchtime, hamburger and fries again with a cup of strawberries. And now, okay, you're just pummeling these antioxidants a little too much, but look, you're basically at baseline and you're going to bed where you woke up. Wait a minute. What if the meal weren't pancakes and bacon? What if it had been like steel cut oatmeal plus berries with a little flaxseed and cinnamon on it? What if it had been my amazing antioxidant smoothie on page 69 of my book? Then all of these phytonutrients, these plant-based chemicals would be flying around your bloodstream, squelching the oxidative stress in minutes and then building up health and maybe even reversing -e it like melting plaque away, like taking away insulin resistance, melting the saturated fat out of those insulin receptors, stopping that cancer cell from dividing. Okay, back to John. I tell him this and then I'm like, anyway, enjoy your breakfast. And then I put the laptop back up and I was like, I'm so annoying. It's been five years. I see John all the time. He still has those darn pancakes and the bacon, but he always, always, always has a cup of strawberries. I am not lying. The other day I was like, you know, blueberries can do it too. All right. So this is what phytonutrients are, plant warfare. I wish I could get in front of more of my doctor colleagues to show them this because they'd be like, wait a minute, this is very reminiscent of chemistry. Exactly. These are powerful tools. I mean, half of our, I don't know about half, don't quote me. A number of medications come from the secrets in the Amazon jungle, right? Plants have power. So when you harness them correctly from whole foods, man, you can stave off a whole host of illnesses. So just to sound fancy, I wanted to tell you some of these phytochemicals, which sound better as phytonutrients because I don't know, chemicals just sounds bad. Okay. It's not though when they're coming from plants, curcumin and turmeric, the ep epigallocatechin gallate, EGCG in green tea, the resveratrol in the skin of red grapes and in red wine, the omega-3 fatty acids in flax seeds and avocado, the procyanidins in berries, the genistine in soy, the lycopene in tomatoes, the anthocyanidins in apples, and the limonene in oranges. You'd think that a lemon or a lime would have more limonene, but it turns out the orange has more. Okay, so if you really want to defeat cancer, then eat like you mean it. IGF-1, if you don't know this bad boy, you're about to. Insulin-like growth factor one, it has one mission in life and it's to tell everybody to grow, 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 which is really critical and awesome if you're a child that needs to grow up, but your hands only get so big. So what is IGF-1 doing for the rest of your life? Turns out your brain's super smart, tells your liver how much to make for today's tasks because IGF-1 is required for replacing all the cells that we turn over which is 50 billion a day, isn't that remarkable? Uh, to help post-exercise muscles to repair, to protect our neurons in our brain. So we're grateful for IGF-1, but when there's an excess, it's just screaming at stuff to grow. Grow plaque, grow fat. Hey, grow cancer, grow that cancer into the liver, into the lung, grow, whoa. Somebody better slow that IGF-1 down. And it turns out that it's you. Here's a study. 6,381 adults over the age of 50, this is a long study, followed 18 years. And what they found was that those ages 50 to 65, higher versus lower animal protein levels led to, boom, 430% more cancer death and 7,300% more diabetes, type two diabetes. 74 times. And you know what's interesting is that IGF-1 emerged as an important moderator of this association between the protein and mortality because wherever protein went, IGF-1 was sure to follow. Just like Mary and her little lamb, especially true if Mary ate her lamb. Um, but 
the point I'm making is this was high versus low animal protein consumption. This isn't even a high versus vegetarian, high versus vegan, right? It's, and these are already astounding numbers. In fact, what would happen if you didn't have IGF-1? Well, people in Ecuador, I mean, they could be anywhere, but they happen to be living mostly in Ecuador, have Laron syndrome. And they have the inability to use IGF-1. They make it, but they don't have receptors that work well. So they all have medical dwarfism because they don't grow. But here's the crazy astounding thing. Guess what? Nobody with Laron syndrome in the history of the world has ever had breast cancer. Not only that, they've never had any cancers, except one lady had a stage one ovarian cancer in 2017, and she's happily still alive. What? That's amazing. Do you want to know another astounding thing that they have never, ever had in the history of people with Laron syndrome? Type two diabetes. That's how required IGF-1 is for the formation, propagation, metastasis of all cancers and the development of type two diabetes. You wanna know what I love when someone says to me, doc, you clearly like love talking about this stuff and um, it's just too late for me, okay? I'm 68, I'm overweight, now I have breast cancer, I've been living this way forever and it is too, blah, blah, blah. don't you dare say that word. It is never too late for you, sister. Let me tell you about this study. Okay. They took 50 obese women and they didn't have cancer or anything. They just signed them up for the study and they took their blood and they measured it. IGF-1 levels and IGF-1 binding protein, which is like a body snatcher that retires too much IGF-1 from circulation. And they dripped their blood on a Petri dish filled with human breast cancer cells. A few cells died because if you're alive, your immune system's doing a little something, something against those cancer cells, right? And then all 50 women went away and they followed this, the Pritikin plan, a low fat, 10 to 15% of daily calories, high fiber, 30 to 40 grams per 1,000 kcal a day, that's a lot of fiber, a whole food plant-based diet and daily exercise classes that were not rigorous. It was like sauntering with a little pep in their step occasionally. So, and they lasted 30 minutes. So how long did they go? They went away for 12 um, years. No, 12 months. Uh-uh, 12 weeks. Oh no, 12 days. They came back 12 days later, drew the blood. IGF-1 had plummeted. IGF-1 binding protein skyrocketed. And now they drew that same new blood, put it on the same new Petri dish filled with human breast cancer cells. And whew, the majority of breast cancer cells died on the spot. In less than two weeks, these women transformed their blood into a cancer-kicking machine. I want that blood, don't you? Oh, Doc, you make a lot of sense, but I love me myself some meat. <laughs> I like cheeseburgers. All right, I hear you. And I'm not even going to start talking about how eating meat and dairy leads to horrific animal cruelty, water pollution, water scarcity. I mean, it does take 5,000 gallons or thereabouts to make one pound of a beef patty. Uh, oh, pesticide and antibiotic overuse, uh, the emergence of antibiotic resistant superbugs, which could be the death of us all. 80% of all antibiotics, by the way, are used on the animals we eat because their conditions are so skank that if they didn't get the antibiotics, your plate would be filled with pus. I'm not talking about it. Um, nor am I mentioning how Big Aggie accounts for about 30% of all greenhouse gas emissions, which is more than all transportation sources combined. And it's responsible for 90% of all deforestation, releasing 50 billion tons of carbon into the sky, leading to climate change, biodiversity loss, ocean dead zones, planet destruction, exacerbation of world hunger. Huh? How does that happen? Oh, 82% of starving children live where livestock consume the food, and then the Westerners consume the livestock. I'm not talking about catastrophic natural disasters, such as heat waves, floods, wildfires, melting ice caps, and irony upon irony, the end of life on this planet. Despite the fact that animal agriculture is the number one contributor to all of those stated atrocities, I'm not even gonna say that any of that is a reason to avoid low carb meat-centric diets like keto. 
I'm just going to give you one reason. Three letters, actually. The LAD, left anterior descending. It's an artery. It's the artery around your heart that feeds your heart. Okay, this is a picture of an artery where like ee, the blood is barely getting through, right? It's open and then ee, it's not open. And then it's got some distal flow there. Um, this randomized controlled trial, which some of you may notice this name, Dean Ornish, was published in July, 1990. I need to highlight that because I went to medical school in 1992 and I only found about this revelatory game changer in 2017 when I did research for my book. So little just FYI about how my journey went. I was writing this book, press the owner's manual. Every single fact I wrote has a reference in the back. Even things I would say for two decades plus, like 80% of all breast cancers are fueled by estrogen. I'd be like, hmm, maybe it's 82% now, or maybe it went down. Maybe it's seven. I better look this up and boom, I made sure every fact, every fact was backed by science. Cause I knew I needed the book to be bulletproof cause I figured bullets might fly. And I, I don't want to be spreading falsehood into the world. And I just always have to be right. That's why I'm delightful to be married to. So here I am diving into the nutritional science and I'm going into it to prove that the way I've been eating my whole life is correct, which was largely Mediterranean diet style. I'm a high school product of the eighties. So bread, pasta, rice, and potatoes ah, make you fat. And so I was mostly, um, high protein, low carb. It's certainly all the processed foods, but every single meal had animal something on it, right? So I thought I was so healthy with my like low fat Greek yogurt or non-fat. And then my big old salad at lunch, salmon, feta. And then my big plate of veggies for dinner, organic chicken breast. So I go into the science to prove that I'm right eating this way. Oh, and so much sushi. Oh my gosh, my husband, Andy and I were definitely radioactive. I was like, don't check my mercury. I don't want to know. So diamond in the science. And it is so abundantly clear to me, study after study after study, that the healthiest diet on the planet is plant-based. Um, I was just really shocked when I found that this one had been published in 1990 and I didn't hear a peep about anything ever until I went and wrote a book and did my own research. So your doctors, I say all this to, you probably have noticed, but they, we don't get any nutrition ever in medical school, in my residency, in my fellowship, it never comes up. I mean, the Krebs cycle, how to make ATP, but not nutrition, not the power of food. And therefore it must not have any power because somewhere, some, someone somewhere along the way should have said something to me. And now I'm all grown up with a lot of debt and I'm about to start my breast cancer surgery practice. And after a long day, you think I'm going to go home and open up like green leafy magazine and see if there are any pearls of nutritional wisdom. Someone should have already given them to me. Well, this, my friends, is not Green Leafy Magazine. It's The Lancet. It's one of the most reputable journals in the world. And what did Dean Ornish show way back then? Well, he did a prospective randomized controlled trial to determine whether or not diet and lifestyle changes could, in fact, affect coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis. So he had all of these people either in the control group, just humming along with meds as usual, seeing their doctor, and then the experimental group, Oh, wait, hey, everybody, before you go and do your thing, which is either the same thing or eating largely uh, plant-based vegetarian with some other healthy lifestyle behaviors, such as stress reduction and exercise and stop smoking, I'm going to inject uh, some dye into you. And we're going to do some um, uh, quantitative coronary angiography. And eee, there's the vessel. All right. Everybody goes away for a year. We've got the experimental group eating largely plant-based with some other healthy lifestyle behaviors. They all come back a year later and it becomes artery wide open. Are you kidding me? Plants did that? Kale and broccoli? There were no medications. There were no operations. That was the power of choices that we make on a daily basis. But, you know, maybe Dr. Ornish lies. I think not. Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn was on the other side of the country at the same time that Dr. Ornish was doing his work. And this was all in the late 80s and 90s. So it was pre-internet, right? They had no idea. They were both doing the exact same thing. So Dr. Essie 
oh, I call him Essie because um, his family does. And then one day I just jumped right into his kitchen and pretended to be one of the gang. It took them like hours to notice because there's a lot of Esselstyn. Um, did you know, by the way, that he was a breast surgeon in his career? You would have thought he was a cardiothoracic surgeon because this book he published in 2007 details the astounding results of a 20 year plus nutritional study on 200 cardiac cripples, the longest study of its kind ever conducted. And he too has, these are definitely from the eighties, but look at this, this moth eaten artery, like ee, barely did, and then shoo, wide open. To me, there is only one diet in the history of the world that's been scientifically proven to be able to slow, stop, and even reverse in some cases, this number one killer of everyone on the planet, heart disease. But it's also been proven to prevent or slow or stop or even beep, 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 reverse all of our killers, stroke, Alzheimer's, obesity, diabetes, cancer. And beyond that, you know, the way or the choices, the diet and lifestyle, they don't have to kill us. They can just kill our joy with like chronic back pain or obesity that hurts my joints all the time or irritable bowel syndrome or mood instability, depression, anxiety. And I had no idea that all of this that's making my daily life less joyful than it could and should be is because of what was on the end of my fork or that I chose to sit instead of stand or to stand instead of walk briskly to drink too much alcohol. It's so exciting to me, but when bacon and bulletproof coffee can do all of that and reverse all of that or stave off progression, then keto lovers, you will have my attention. Here's the basic question we get when people are like, oh, I'm so sold on it, but mm, where do I get my protein? We need about 0.36 grams per pound. So for a 140 pound woman, that's about 50 grams. And I'd like to just remind you, uh, proteinaholics out there, that the elephant, rhino, hippo, and all the meats that people eat for protein, like cows, pigs, chickens, deer, and elk, are herbivores. So it is completely possible to get all of your protein from plants. But here is uh, the, the heavy list. Seitan, not for the celiacs out there. It is wheat gluten, but it's like a chewy, meaty texture. If you've never cooked with it, I highly recommend it. It's fun and delicious and has a ton of protein, like a third cup, 21 grams, you're almost halfway there. Soy, tempeh, tofu, edamame, uh, 20 grams and a half cup, uh, 20 to 30 in a, in a full cup. And soy milk though, it only has eight grams. Lentils, one cup, 18 grams. Beans, kin kidney, pinto, black, white, green, garbanzo, a whole cup, 15 grams. Nut or nut butters, seeds, a quarter cup, seven to 10 grams, green peas, one cup, eight grams, quinoa, half cup. This is a complete protein, by the way. It has all of the essential um, amino acids in it, as does soy, two complete protein, proteins for you. But you know what? All of this stuff, don't count grams. Just don't. Just eat. No one in America has quashi or core, which is a protein deficiency, for real, except someone who's already sick from something else, maybe. All right. I'm in a transition now into my top 12 breast superfoods. I'm not going to spend a crazy amount of detail on all of them, but some of them, I just want to do a little deeper dive with you. So soy surprises people that it's on the list. In fact, it apparently is at the top of the list. Why is this? Well, it's time you found out the truth, the real deal on soy. Turns out that, um, oh yeah, here's me. Sorry about this. Um, when I wrote my book, have I said that yet? I went into the nutritional science. Did I already mention that? Oh, but this time to prove that I was correct for 18 years as a breast cancer surgeon, telling my cancer patients to spit that miso out of your mouth. You can't have soy milk. What's wrong with you? There's estrogens in that soy. 80% of breast cancers, including yours, Missy, are fueled by estrogen. Uh-uh, no soy for you. <gasps> oh, when I went into the science to prove with facts uh, that my stance was correct. In fact, the facts show that soy is quite anti-estrogenic and anti-carcinogenic within our bodies. And um, yeah, embarrassingly wrong. Very sorry about that. What's the deal? The deal is we have two estrogen receptors in our body, two, not four, two estrogen. Alpha, which is the one on cancer cells. And when estrogen from your body hits this alpha receptor, it sends a signal to the cancer to multiply and divide. 
Beta, on the other hand, the isoflavones like genistein and datezine in soy with 1600% more affinity love beta. So what does it do when it hits beta? It shuts alpha down. And it goes out into your fat cells where you have an enzyme called aromatase that is converting steroids into more estrogen, more cancer fuel. And the beta receptor goes out there and shuts the aromatase down. Huh. Well, if that's so true, then shouldn't people who consume a bunch of soy have less breast cancer? Oh, yeah, they should. And they do. So here are a few studies just to prove the point. You can read up on them in more detail later, but I'm just showing you here between 43 to 59% drop for the highest versus lowest consumers of soy. I will point at this, the BRCA gene mutation carriers, by and large, a BRCA1 has a 75% chance that her cancer, unlike everybody else who's mostly estrogen driven, is triple negative. It has no estrogen receptors, progesterone or HER2, triple negative, the most aggressive, hardest subtype of breast cancer that we have to treat. They, high versus low consumers had a 43% drop. So it's not just about this estrogenic connection with soy. I'm not done. Here is a 2020 study that's really robust and multi-ethnic, which I love. Um, there's almost 30% of the participants were black and they followed them for almost eight years. They were all initially free of cancer. 1,057 new breast cancer cases occurred during follow-up. And what they found was that when you substitute median intakes, so median is like half at and above, half below, the median intake of dairy milk versus median intake, same quantity in soy milk, the soy milk consumers had 32% less breast cancer. And when we're just looking at milk only, check this out, the 90th, so the most, the highest consumption of milk versus the least, the 10th percentile, they had a 50% bump in breast cancer. Well, I got a whole thing about dairy, but we can't go into it. All right. So I'm hearing you. We consume soy. We have less estrogen production. We have blockage of receptors. But if I have an estrogen-driven breast cancer already, like I'm a thriver out here, I should still avoid it, right? Because we're not really sure. We weren't really sure until 2009 when all the human studies in soy and breast cancer started pouring out like kids at recess. Um, okay, so this is the LACE study. Um, almost 2000 multi-ethnic survivors, they're all taking tamoxifen, they're followed over six years, 60% recurrence for high versus low consumption. Another very robust 6,200 uh, multi-ethnic survivors followed for 9.4 years. I like this one because this isn't just a drop in recurrence. Now we're talking about a drop in death, all causes of death. So soy is doing magical things in other parts of your body other than, than um, breast cancer cells. But there's a drop, 32% drop in mortality for estrogen-driven cancers in women not on tamoxifen. Okay, so they're not taking it, but they had estrogen. That's something. And then a 51% drop in mortality for the estrogen negatives. Remember the bad actors that are really hard to treat and cure. It goes on. There's another study with 5,000, less recurrence, less mortality, 10,000 people, just a wimpy half cup of milk a day, soy milk, uh, dropped recurrence by 25%. And I have to tell you, I really did a deep dive into these studies. Some of this high versus low consumption stuff is not a lot. We're talking about literally uh, half a cup of soy milk being in the high group, high consumer group. Um, for those who are worried about soy's other effects, I love this paper. It just came out this year, 2021. It's by Dr. Messina. And he looked at, and his crew, looked at 417 human studies and the interaction between humans and isoflavone intake. Because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And what they found is that isoflavones in soy are not endocrine disruptors. So plant estrogen intake does not adversely affect thyroid function, estrogen levels, ovulation in women, semen levels in men, no negative effects in children like little boy boobs called gynecomastia when I actually say it. All right, so soy it up people. Cruciferous veggies, superfood number two. Broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, turnips, radish, watercress, kale, arugula, collards, bok choy, Swiss chard, all of them. The high isothiocyanate content in these cruciferous veggies 
is probably the reason for the breast cancer reduction. And here's a pro tip in order to get the most bang for your broth, when you chew broccoli, the little cell compartments open up and this enzyme myrosinase comes out and transforms the isothiocyanate, the ITC into sulforaphane. It wasn't there before. And sulforaphane is this like green caped superhero of a phytochemical that can literally seek out and destroy cancer cells. Ooh, I have so many studies about the power of sulforaphane in your body, but just know myrosinase enzyme destroyed by heat and cooking. So magic trick, if roasted broccoli is your favorite food on planet earth, as is mine, roast away and then just tap it, tap it, tap it in broccoli. Any job? Okay. And then you sprinkle the raw broccoli floret pieces into your roasted broccoli and voila, the uh, myrosinase is back in action and out comes sulforaphane. The third magical breast superfood is flax. Flax has the most concentrated um, healthy omega-3 fatty acids on the planet, but that's not why I'm wanting you to flax it up. It's because they have well over a hundred times the lignin content of most other foods. And lignins exhibit all kinds of anti-breast cancer virtues. Uh, they slow abnormal cell growth and they're anti-angiogenic. Remember the blood vessels squelching because we don't want those uh, cells to be able to run away. I love this study, 32 breast cancer patients. They all had a breast biopsy showing cancer and they're gonna have their definitive surgery in five weeks. But before you do, can I give you this muffin to eat every day? Um, it's basically junk food. So do everything you were doing before and then just have some junk food. Half of the people got a muffin with the equivalent of two tablespoons of ground flax a day. The other just got junk food. Everybody eats their muffin. And now five weeks later, definitive surgery, they had measured on the core biopsy to diagnose it, three important things that we look at in cancer. One is KI-67. It's the division rate. It answers the question, how what percentage of cells under here are one becoming two? Then they looked at an expression of aggression called CRB2. And then they looked at apoptosis, which is cancer cell suicide, where the cells are just dying. Okay. Here's what happened in the flaxseed group from five weeks of two tablespoons a day, coupled with some probably bad fats and enriched wheat flour. KS67 dropped 34.2% in five weeks. That, that's crazy. Okay, CRB2 dropped 71% and apoptosis, the cancer cell suicide rate went up 30.7%. Clearly the only suicide rate that people should get excited about. Dietary fiber is a superfood. So greens, beans, and berries. I want you to get at least 30 grams a day, please, for enjoying a 40% drop in breast cancer. It, it has a multitude of reasons fiber does for why it's um, anti-carcinogenic. It literally binds estrogen in your GI tract and makes you poop it out. But make sure you are getting enough fiber. Berries, more fiber, but a cup of blueberries a week slowed down the rates of cognitive decline in this Harvard study. And then there was another Harvard study, apparently they love berries over there, um, that was 20 years long, looking at 93,000 women. And they found that those who ate the most berries had the least cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. So boom, you're protecting your breast, your brain, your heart, and your response to insulin. Bury it up. Apples. Can an apple a day keep breast cancer away? Apparently so. One good study showed there was a 24% drop in women who ate an apple a day, um, uh, not apple pie, no, just the actual apple. And it turns out that extracts from the peel kill breast cancer cells in a Petri dish, but not so much so from the pulp. So eat the peels. Lycopene in tomatoes can slow cancer cell growth. You want to um, stimulate the bioavailability though by heating tomatoes for like 15 minutes and it's fat soluble. So you're gonna have it with something like your avocados or olives. Mushrooms are aromatase inhibitors, the things that you know, the fat cell enzyme, right? The conversion. Guess what? Well, you don't have to guess because I put the picture of it. I should do something else. The point is the cheapo white button has more aromatase inhibition than like all the fancy chanterelles and oyster mushrooms. Garlic, onions, leeks, shallots, shallots, or shallots. I'm going to make up a new allium vegetable. In scallions, these bulbs, these immunity boosters. There was one study from France where those women who consumed 11 to 12 servings weekly had 75% less breast cancer. Now, just like a broccoli and the sulforaphane issue, now we've got the same issue with heat destroying allicinase, which is the magical enzyme that makes all the amazing stuff come out. 
same story saute away then just chop up a little bit of the raw stuff whether it's garlic or an onion and sprinkle it back in and uh, then your enzymes there look at this table i love this one so mcf7 these are um breast cancer cells in a petri dish and then they put extracts from all of these amazing veggies on here and saw the uh, proliferation rates right to see mcf7 uh, by the way is estrogen positive so your typical American eating like tomatoes and butter lettuce over here is, is not doing much to the percentage of cells that are proliferating. They're still like kind of going strong, but look what annihilates them. It's crazy. The cruciferous veggies I've boxed in green and the garlic and onions are in blue. Woo. All right, seaweed is another superfood. A Korean study showed that daily consumption of gim, which is uh, like a sheet of nori, you know, sushi wrap, drops breast cancer by over 50%. So try snacking on those or just throw a teaspoon of powdered spirulina into a salad dressing or something. Turmeric, we met this uh, spice when I mentioned the curcumin. It's what makes it that crazy yellow that turns my blender like ochre yellow and then I wanna buy a new one. <laughs> Every like three months I'm like, oh, my blender's yellow again because I always put turmeric in my smoothies. Um, and piperine in pepper, black pepper, increases the bioavailability bio of curcumin by almost, um, by up to 2000%. And it's fat soluble. So add a little flax or avocado to max out that absorption. And numero 12 is cacao. The 70% cacao solid um, dark chocolate gets an anti-cancer thumbs up because it delivers quite a punch of antioxidants more than it does cocoa fat and sugar. <gasps> I have a bonus, bonus superfood, number one. Actually, it's the only bonus superfood. Um, what is that thing? It's anti-inflammatory, anti-estrogenic, anti-diabetic, and anti-atherogenic, making clots in arteries. Hmm. There was this study that looked at the ORAC scale. So it tested all of these foods, beverages, spices, herbs, supplements that are used, like everything from Coca-Cola to coconuts and the tippity tippity top, like, hello, blueberry, 124 times less potent down there. The tippity tippity top was this thing. It's the Indian gooseberry. But because um, you can't really find that in your grocery stores, they are in Europe. But anyway, um, there's our Pink Lotus Elements has their own production. And Cyrus does too, actually, because we both are omla lovers. So omla boss, this is highly potent, totally organic, of course, vegan. And uh, you just need an eighth of a teaspoon to get all the power out of it. Here I have now two bonus super drinks. This drink is aloe tonic. So it, it, it involves a cold extract process that allows you to consume the entire aloe vera leaf. Why do you wanna do that? Because as most of us plant-based lovers know, the phytonutrient power is mostly concentrated in the skin, but there's also some toxins there in aloe. So this is a very unique cold extraction technique. It's super purified. Aloe has, these mucopolysaccharides and ACE mannan literally destroys estrogen receptors on can and breast cancers, but it's so anti-inflammatory. Obviously, like we reach for aloe gel if you get a little sunburn, but now when you drink this, you're getting it on the inside of the cells. Now we're back to that bathtub. You see what we're doing with all these foods. It's like you're taking away the bath salts, you're taking away the rubber ducky, and now cancer just sitting in that tub. It's like dirty water. It's like, pff, may as well die now. Okay. Pop quiz, we're headed to the end. What is the drink enjoyed by most centenarians on the planet? Water, tea, red wine, or gin and tonic? Tea, green tea. Of course, everybody's drinking water, but they're not drinking it particularly any more than anybody else. So the magic is in tea and the real magic is in green tea. I love this study. 1160 breast cancer patients followed nine years, three cups or more of green tea per day, dropped recurrence in the stage one ladies by 57% and by 31% in stage two. Pro tip, always squeeze some lemon into your green tea because it increases the antioxidant absorption capacity fivefold. And we also have an excellent source from Japan organic, um, amazing green tea that actually has had a study in it and it has 137 times the antioxidant potency of your basic green tea. 
how, how are we supposed to eat all of these things every day? Like, seriously, if I have a rice bowl or something like that, I'm like, oh, I could have put some turmeric on that and I ate it already. Like, now what? So here's my answer to now what? Smoothies are the answer. You can get my free recipe here at pinklotus.com slash smoothie. And look what it has you doing. You're consuming 11 of the top 15 foods that we just mentioned. And I suppose if you really want to be odd, you could add the tomatoes, mushrooms, garlic, and seaweed. But look at that. Bam. We hit them all just in this smoothie, which, by the way, is delicious. So here is my feed it breast cancer checklist. Consume a whole food plant-based diet that prioritizes vegetables, fruits, 100% whole grains, and legumes like beans, peas, and lentils. Whole food soy, ground flaxseed, eliminate all meat, poultry, dairy, fish, and eggs. Minimize saturated fat, simple sugars, processed foods, and refined cereals. This is my healthy version of a food plate, 70% fruits and veggies, 15% whole grains, 15% whole protein and uh, scattered with some healthy fats coming from avocado, nuts, seeds. Next exercise, how much is enough? Five hours a week, if you can chit chat with a friend, two and a half hours of like oh, vigorous, super sweaty exercise. I got a lot of data on exercise and ask me about it if you want. Minimize or eliminate alcohol. Seven drinks or fewer a week. And if you choose to drink, I suggest you favor red wine. It does have a couple of redemptive properties, resveratrol and aromatase. There's that enzyme again and all the fat inhibition. Oh, fat. That's why being overweight or obese elevates breast cancer risk between 50 and 250%. There's no question or doubt in all of the science that overweight and obese women have more breast cancer, more death from breast cancer, um, well, more recurrence and more death. So you want to get to your ideal body weight and stay there forever. I am so excited every year, this is the third year in a row, I team up with the amazing Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and a bunch of celebrities and bring you the Let's Beat Breast Cancer.org campaign, where we encourage women and men to take our challenge online. All you have to do is sign up and boom, you get a free digital goodie bag full of goodies. You get weekly newsletters that help give practical tips and tricks on how to take the challenge, which is this, to prioritize whole food plant-based eating, exercise regularly, minimize alcohol, and maintain an ideal body weight. I want to invite everybody to my summit. The Cancer Kicking Summit is this Saturday and Sunday, October 16, 17. I do it every year at this gorgeous, oh, so COVID, uh, oceanfront, Terranea Resort. It's in Southern California. And it is October 16, 17, coming up this Saturday and Sunday. I have basically 14 hours of what I just did, but it is so fun. And I've basically taken all of my medical knowledge from 25 years and distilled it down into fun, actionable, take it home right now, start right now power. These seven habits, these trees, if you will, Seven? 10. There's 10. 10 trees that you want to plant in the orchard of your life to live the most fruitful, bountiful, healthiest existence possible. So please, please join me. If you can come live, I'd love to meet you. But there's also the virtual that's available now. And the discount code is FOK20 to get 20% off. I do have a book. It looks like I wrote two, but on the paperback, they're just like, yeah, we don't want your picture on it. We're going to do the lemons instead. So if you'd like to read about the things I'm talking about, you may. And I'm calling all women out there, breast cancer or not, to join the entirely free Power Up community at pinklotus.com slash power up. This is bursting with ways to connect with others, to educate yourself, to fundraise and do more. We've got all of these different categories, including my cancer kicking kitchen and breast uh, buddies, which is very near and dear to my heart because this is very special. Um, you have to have or had breast cancer to be a breast buddy, but you can all be part of Power Up. This has about 5,000 members and it pairs newly diagnosed women age for age, stage for stage, treatment for treatment with those who have been there, done that solely for the purposes of psychosocial support and camaraderie and sisterhood. There's no charges. It's just literally, you just plug in like 42 years old, stage one mastectomy chemo and like match.com for breasts. Here, here come all these women who have, who match you. And then you can look a little more and be like, oh, she has a 10 year old boy. I want to talk to her. So check out Power Up and Breast Buddies if you'd like. And then we do have an online store that has 
Um, become a leading online women's health store. There's nothing kitschy in there. There's nothing wrong with ribbon earrings, but we don't have those. We have products that are always vegan and truly when it can be vetted by a randomized controlled trial, it is. So all of our supplements are very uniquely, intelligently formulated with women in mind, both before and after a breast cancer diagnosis to maximize their health. And that is your breast defense for the day. Wow. I was spelled on. I was literally sitting there with my mouth wide open the entire time. That's why I had to turn off the camera because I was like, wow, this is very good information. <laughs> Thank you, Cyrus. Incredibly good. So um, as you were talking, actually, the chat box was uh, going nuts. There were a lot of people asking a, really, a ton of really good questions about food, about you know breast cancer physiology and beyond. So how about we just kind of go into them one by one and just kind of start to knock them off? Fire away. Now, here's basically, if, if anybody can stump Dr. Funk, that would be very impressive. <laughs> if anybody can come up with something that she can't answer, I would be very, very, very impressed. Okay. So here's the first question. Tammy says, uh, does obesity raise the risk for breast cancer, even if you are on a plant-based diet? Unfortunately, it does because the mere fact of being obese means you have more adipose tissue and fat is not only in our, the aromatase enzyme converting estrogen, which fuels 80% of breast cancers, but fat in and of itself, the adipocyte, the fat cell, is constantly spewing out the fancy term is cytokines, but these inflammatory substances into your body. And we all know that a state of low chronic inflammation is every disease's playground. But here's the beautiful thing, lose the weight, lose the risk. So stick with the plant-based diet. If you're kind of plateauing, I suggest you really take a look at your oils that can sneak in and keep the weight and the pounds on and the nuts and the calorie dense foods and really make sure my food plate, the 70% is truly fruits and vegetables. And I think you'll jumpstart more weight loss or just read Dr. Gregor's book, how not to diet, man, that guy's a genius. Absolutely. Um, qu question coming from me here. Is there a way for somebody to calculate their ideal body weight? Like how does somebody know if they're actually overweight or not? Oh, that's a great question. So I have a calculator for you at pinklotus.com slash BMI. BMI stands for body mass index. Mm -hmm. And that's how you find out if you're too chubby. You just plug in your height and your weight and you will find out. Um, so ideally you're between 18.5 and 24.9. There is such a thing as being underweight. Um, but most people, as we know, about 72% of Americans are overweight <clears throat> and actually obese is 30 and above for the BMI. So calculate your BMI and then you'll know how far you have to go. Mm -hmm. Perfect. 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 Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Um, due to time, we can only really answer maybe like two maximum three more questions. So I'm just going to kind of get them quickly. Talk too much. I'm so sorry, guys. No, no, this is fantastic. Jenny asks. At what age should a woman start examining herself? If you don't have any family history of breast cancer and no gene mutations, is it necessary? Can, can you skip mammograms? Jenny, that's a two-part question. So I love this question. I actually advise girls as soon as they start menstruating to do self-breast exams. I've got a great video, uh, again, in the power up uh, video section, um, easybreastexam.com for a fast link to it. It teaches you in five minutes how to do an amazing self-breast exam. Do I really think a 13 year old is going to get has breast cancer? Absolutely not. I want young girls to become so familiar and confident in the lumpy bumpiness of their breasts that heaven forbid, 20 plus years later, if something is new, their fingers have this complete unconscious memory of the lumpy bumpiness and they'll stop and be like, that wasn't there before I'm getting it checked out. I just hear too many women like wigged out about touching their own breasts. They're like, mm, I'm not going to do it because it just freaks me out. I think everything is cancer. And of course you do because you don't have that consistency. So watch the video and learn that mammograms. Oh, there's so many recommendations out there um, for good reason. And so some say to start at 50, start at 40, skip every other year, never skip years. It all comes down to a risk versus benefit. And the risk is missing a life-threatening cancer. And then the benefit is, is that you get to have your life saved for an earlier stage cancer most of the time. But there's so much more that goes into this calculation. And they're not like breast cancer surgeons on the front lines that are in the rooms looking at these. It's like epidemiologists and people who are looking at it more like a numbers game. How many mammograms does it take to save one life? If your answer is 
it takes 1900 mammograms to save a life, then you should start at age 50 because then it only takes 1300 mammograms. And that is literally what the um, recommendations that came out in 2002 said, like 1900, too many mammograms, 1300, that's worth it. Let's start at 50, forget about 40. I side with the American Society of Breast Surgeons and the American College of Radiology. We recommend that women at normal risk for breast cancer start at age 40 and don't stop or skip years until you plan to die in the next 10 years, which is admittedly hard to predict. Fascinating, <laughs> absolutely fascinating. It's funny how so much of the information that you present here, it doesn't necessarily like refute the, the information in the mainstream media, but it like, it puts a twist on it, right? And it's like, you even mentioned before that when you went through medical school, you never talked about nutrition. You didn't have time to talk about nutrition. And yet that is literally the single most important uh, risk factor for determining whether or not you will develop uh, breast cancer in the future. It's mind boggling. I know. Uh, here's a question. Uh, I think this came in from multiple people. Does turmeric decrease tamoxifen efficacy? No, no, it doesn't. I've studied that because it has come up. My patients ask me now in super physiologic doses. Yes. That's why I'm not the biggest fan of like all these supplements nonstop. Right. I think what you just need to do is throw a quarter teaspoon of turmeric on a meal or into a smoothie and call it a day. They don't go excessive with it. Got it. Okay, cool. So just a, a little bit, a little bit goes a long way. Uh, okay. Last question. You mentioned that alcohol is a risk factor for uh, breast cancer but yet red wine is an antioxidant. So is it okay if I drink a little bit of red wine um, once a day because I like drinking wine and it's tasty or is that <laughs> gonna increase my risk for <laughs> Um, so I have a whole thing on alcohol in my stomach because it's, it's a deep topic and it's near and dear to many a merry drinker's heart. Um, so. Of all the alcohols, there is nothing redemptive about liquor or beer, you know, or anything, and even white wine. Red wine, as I mentioned in passing, does have two big redemptive qualities, the resveratrol, which by the way, if you don't drink, don't start drinking red wine for the resveratrol <laughs> from the skin of red good, grapes and even blueberries. Yes. So I'm not advocating drinking to get the resveratrol, get it from the fruit. And it also uh, decreases estrogen production. There was a a big well-designed study and I talk in my summit again about the J-curve effect and all of this like there is some behind the scenes messing with the baseline group to make drinking one or two drinks a day look like it was protective against heart disease against neurodegenerative disorders against all cancers um, they actually in oh now I'm just explaining it but in that group um, that is your comparative group because they don't drink oh wait a minute but what, what's that now oh you used to drink like a lot, like your liver is on the kaputs, you're on cirrhosis level three or whatever, and you're in that group because you don't drink now. Now all of a sudden these sick people at a baseline as the non-drinking group are kind of easy to beat if you're like healthy and running around playing tennis and have a drink of wine a day, right? So that's what happened to 85% of the studies. Actually, that's the number. 85% have the J-curve effect, meaning a drink or two is better than the no drinks. But then once you hit three or more, you start to get worse than the, than the non-drinkers. It turns out the non-drinkers for the most part, not for the most part, but mixed in them were the drinkers. It is, even the American Cancer Society says that you can have one drink a day for women and two drinks a day for men with very little health uh, adverse outcomes. So the ideal quantity, one glass of red wine is five ounces. And there was a good study done that looked at consumption of all alcohols versus all cause mortality. And there was a 24% drop in one and only one group. And that is those who drank four to eight ounces of red wine a day. Everybody else, no drop in mortality. But mm, interesting. Yeah. All cause mortality being premature death from any cause. Exactly. So very helpful. Okay. We could talk for hours. We really could. Um, but this has been, we're a little bit out of time here. We're actually a little bit over, but uh, your presentation was phenomenal. Uh, people were super engaged and there's actually still, let me check, uh, 1,300,000 people in this room right now, which is amazing. So uh, if you uh, missed the beginning of this presentation, um, please also consider joining the uh, Forks Over Knives cooking course. 
Uh, and also join Dr. Fung's incredible cancer kicking summit, which is again happening later this week. Is that right? It's this week, people. Okay, Pinklotus.com so slash summit. Perfect. So there's a link. There should be a link in the chat box for you to check out, but it's pinklotus.com slash summit. Go there, join it. Trust me, it's phenomenal. If you even had a uh, glimmer of an epiphany, as Dr. Funk was talking today, uh, expect that tenfold uh, in during her summit. Um, you can also join that in person or you can join it virtually. Either one, both of them are open. And um, there's a discount, FOK20, 20% off. There you go. FOK20 is your discount code. So go ahead and put that in and you'll get 20% off. Uh, and then also don't forget to check out the Forks Over Nice cooking course. Uh, there's also a discount code for that. You'll, that'll save you 25% off if you register by Friday. And that discount code is FOK25. To do that, go to forksoverknives.com slash cooking dash course. Forksoverknives.com slash cooking dash course. Christy, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for your time and for your knowledge and for sharing this information widely and for free. We very much appreciate it. Thank you, Cyrus. So happy to have been here with all of you. Fantastic. So uh, thanks for joining us here today. And we will catch you next time uh, in the next episode of the uh, Forks Over Knives webinar series. Have a great day, guys, and we will catch you soon. Bye. Are we still on? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>